So um, here is a, a picture, which is one of my, my favorite pictures. I'm very keen uh, to get hold of more photographs of um, Anglo-Indians, especially during the colonial period, because my research is focused on, on the colonial period and on the transition from uh, late colonial to decolonization to post-colonial. Uh, here's a quote from John Ricketts in 1830. So uh, I took quite a bit of time talking about the early 19th century origins of Anglo-Indian political organization uh, when I spoke last time. So we won't stay with that. But uh, it's interesting to see how, even in that early period, Ricketts felt that uh, the British used Anglo-Indians as according to their own convenience, or, and defined the group according to their own convenience. And a, lo a lot of the, the definitions of who were to be included in this group were to some degree negotiated and, dict and dictated by uh, the colonial East India Company authorities downwards towards the group. And there was, there was a push in some instances to uh, get the group to call themselves Indo-Britons at that time which, like the word Anglo-Indians, emphasizes a connection with, with Britain and England. Okay, so um, here, here's an interesting quote, which, which is worth having a look at, which shows the, the racial dimension of, of British thinking towards the end of the 19th century. So th there is a, an early phase, um, which um, t generally referred to by the title of... Um, Dalrymple's book, White Mughals, an, an idea that in the early period th there was more possibility of intermarriage, there was more possibility of cultural exchange. Of course, the power dynamics of that cultural exchange were still unequal. And even in, in Dalrymple's book, we can see that um, there was already a kind of snobbish ap attitude, an attitude of judgment, moral judgment, towards the, the mixed-race children of East India Company uh, servants. And those men worried about the future of their offspring. But they often uh, acknowledged these children. And, and the more elite men of that kind sent their children to England for education. And sometimes they concluded that those children would be better off staying in England because they would have more economic prospects than returning to India during a period when the East India Company was extending various restrictions on the possibilities for Anglo-Indian em employment, or Eurasian employment, as they would have said then. So um, th this uh, emphasizes, this quote, um, the, 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 ra the racial dimension of uh, British attitudes towards Anglo-Indians at the end of the 19th century, because the, the late 19th century was a, a high point of the development of so-called scientific racism. And um, certainly that was very dominant in British thinking, along with sort of uh, patronizing attitudes to the group as objects of charity. Um, the well-intentioned philanthropic efforts of charitable, religious, um, and municipal uh, figures in, in the British colonial society towards the group were very genuine, but they were embedded within a series of attitudes which are, are very problematic when we come to analyze them today. Um, this, this is a, an account uh, through just a particular set of figures that represents a pattern more broadly which is mirrored in other sets of figures which shows the decline in jobs for, uh, they're, they're being called Indo-Europeans here, but for the mixed relative to the unmixed indigenous local population. You can see that towards the end of the 19th century, there, there's a decline in, in, in relative and absolute terms. <coughs> so that uh, this is deputy magistrates, deputy collectors working uh, in the service of, of the state, and it, it falls from something like 31.6% in the 1860s down to 
and it, it's, it's a fall in, in absolute terms as well as in relative terms. Um, and then the, uh, the kind of structure of Anglo-Indian employment during the late colonial period, uh, once the community has been given um, a sig significant areas of preferential employment in strategic services, the railways, the telegraphs and posts, the customs services. Somebody mentioned earlier the Indian Medical Service. Uh, that's interesting because very, very, very few Anglo-Indians were in the in Indian Medical Service. Uh, the then Anglo-Indian leader, Sir Henry, Henry Gidney, was unusual because he was, a, he was a very successful ophthalmologist who had a, a thriving public practice in Bombay, and he gave up that practice um, in order to, to become the, the political leader of, of the community. And he was, he was an officer in the Indian Medical Service, which was unusual. There was another department called the Indian Medical Department, which was full of Anglo-Indians. So the Indian Medical Service was mainly for British doctors and Indian doctors, and most of the Anglo-Indians went into this separate department called the Indian Medical Department. It was almost like a communal department for, for Anglo-Indians, and the function of that uh, for the colonial state would be that the cost of um, having Anglo-Indians in the Indian Medical Department was lower than to have assistant uh, surgeons, for example, than to use um, British uh, imported um, doctors and assistant surgeons in the Royal Army Medical Service, um, the Royal Army Medical Corps and would also have been cheaper than the, than the British and Indian doctors in the Indian Medical Service. And there was a process ongoing through the early 20th century of so-called Indianization. And many historians have understood that process as being one of admitting Indians to the, the elite government services like the, the ICS. You know, often known as the heaven-born because they had such a high st social status within colonial society. And uh, so there was, there was pressure that Indians should be admi admitted to the ICS. Uh, and th that pattern is interesting because many Indians ultimately did enter the ICS, but despite the fact that there was a specific scholarship set up for Anglo-Indians to attempt to gain admission to the ICS, I, th I think that... In Anthony's book, he, he says that it's something, it, it was in single digits. You know, during the whole late colonial period, there would have been many Indians who got into the ICS, and uh, yet it was probably less than 10 Anglo-Indians during that whole period that ever entered the ICS. So services which were par primarily British were being Indianized, in response to the demands of Indian nationalists in the various legislatures, but that didn't create new openings for Anglo-Indians, and Anglo-Indians remained in the middle management positions of various government departments, and particularly those departments, such as railways, telegraphs, and customs, which were, which were strategically vital to the internal security of the Raj. The, the railways were used by the Raj to move around soldiers. And in, in the days before the internet, uh, and before faxes, and before w even widespread use of telephones, the most reliable way to communicate was uh, the telegraphs. And so the colonial state needed to move its, it never had enough uh, loyal troops, and if there was any problem with uh, Indian troops that if there was some kind of civil unrest or some kind of rebellion, they might not be trustworthy. They might side with the people revolting against the colonial state. Therefore, the kind of forces that the colonial state could rely upon in that circumstance were the small number of British units, along with some Gurkha regiments, who could be relied on not to have local sympathies with particular communities, be they Hindu or Muslim. And the colonial state also thought a lot about how to incorporate 
Anglo-Indians, who were also regarded as, as being loyal, into some kind of system of military security for the Raj. So it made sense that they were in the railways and in the telegraphs because those were the vital arterial infrastructure of security and of moving around and redeploying troops that could be relied upon in cases of civil disturbances. Um, on some level, this is a kind of a, a police state which is prepared to wage a war almost against a hostile population potentially an insurrection at, at some point. And a lot of the thinking of British security, imperial security, was based on the experience of the so-called Indian mutiny, First War of Independence. I like to use the term the Great Rebellion um, late in the 19th century. Uh, so that, that the, the, the shadow of that experience hung over British thinking about security. And they, they, it was always a balance between how much do we spend on internal security and, uh, and how, how much security can we get. And in that context, Anglo-Indians not only were employed in these supervisory, junior, non, often non-gazetted uh, management positions, but they were also they were also put in charge of key, on the railways, for example, they were put in charge of key railway stations. Um, so, and they were put in charge of specific trains, like the mail trains. Just like the telegraphs, the security of the mail was, was important if there would be potential sabotage. So we can see that the functions that Anglo-Indians provided by being co-opted uh, in the service of the, colonial, uh, the late colonial state. And Practically speaking, it was compulsory for Anglo-Indians working on the railways to be members of the auxiliary force. So they provided an, an additional quasi-military, quasi-policing force that would either be used directly in civil unrest or would guard strategic infrastructure like the railways while British and Gurkha troops might be deployed directly to deal with those disturbances. There was also uh, um, some ideas of using Anglo-Indians more, more extensively um, in military service or in, in, in quasi-military police forces. Uh, but what, what happened was these tended to fall through because of grounds of cost. You know, the, 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 the local provincial authorities would argue with the... Um, the military authorities, the, so the, the civil provincial authorities and the military authorities would say, well, who is going to pay for this? Is it com coming out of your budget or is it coming out of our budget? And the price estimates were often that Anglo-Indian units would cost less than British units but more than Indian units. And, and so often the, these ideas didn't come to fruition. But nonetheless, the locations of Anglo-Indian employment were demonstrably tied to Raj security. And during the First World War and the Second World War, uh, all of the restrictions on Anglo-Indian entry into the army were largely relaxed or ignored to a very great degree. So that sp some specifically Anglo-Indian units were, um, were created belatedly in the First World War, the, the, uh, the Anglo-Indian force, which was sent to Mesopotamia. But also, in practice, um, recruiting agents for various imperial and British regiments and even other broader empire units from you know, South Africa, um, New Zealand, could have uh, people who are Anglo-Indians who had, who had managed to sign up and join all of those regiments. It could be the Dorset Regiment. It could be, um, could be an Indian logistical support unit um, such as uh, the IMDS. So that's, that's the function that Anglo-Indian employment tended to have in terms of the interests of the late colonial state. And that explains why they wanted to retain Anglo-Indians in certain ma management and supervisory roles underneath domiciled Europeans and, uh, and British um, employees 
And you can see the kind of the, the structure that they're called Eurasians in this particular um, chart, but you can see the structure of employment here that the Europeans have the largest number of positions that are the most senior, um, and the domiciled Europeans are present, but there are no Eurasians or Anglo-Indians in the top uh, grade here. But there are two who've made it into the highest grade of, of superintendents, one, one row down. And then the largest concentration are in these, these second grade and third grade superintendents. It's important to state that these jobs are very desirable, very lucrative jobs that Anglo-Indians occupy. They are being subordinated relative to domiciled Europeans and relative to British employees, but they are in a position of immense privilege relative to other Indian communities and relative to the vast masses of the Indian population. In, in salary terms, in terms of the seniority of their position, and it, it affords a level of lifestyle for many Anglo-Indians in the late colonial period, those who are gainfully employed, which puts them in a very privileged position relative to the working class population back in, in England, back at the imperial metropole. Um, and then you can, you can see the, the quality of life that is, is achievable for an Anglo-Indian family where somebody is employed by the colonial state. Um, so this is in a remote area, Den Kanikota, and this man is working in the forestry department. He's got quite a junior position. But what we see here is a kind of middle-class colonial domesticity and an attempt to project a certain kind of ethos of, of lifestyle, of aspiration, of civilization, as they would have regarded it. Um, there's the tiger skin that associates them with shikar, the practice of hunting. A lot of Anglo-Indians, including both Sir Henry Gidney and Frank Antony, were shikaris, and they, Anglo-Indians like to, many Anglo-Indians who could, like to engage in hunting and shikari because it associated them with the elite uh, colonial Britons, because elite colonial Britons and Indian Maharajas and princes liked to engage in, in hunting. So this, this was an elite uh, practice. Most average Indians did not engage in it, but a lot of Anglo-Indians across different uh, socioeconomic groups um, wanted to emulate this and, uh, and did. And we can see one of the ch children has a hockey stick, which points towards the importance of hockey in particular in Anglo-Indian schools. Um, European-looking looking dolls and, uh, and clothes, which, uh, which obviously follow European styles. That's the Anglo-Indian force I mentioned, which was belatedly sanctioned to fight in the First World War. Uh, in Mesopotamia. By the time that it was sanctioned, when the British realized they needed more manpower than they thought to fight the war, already m large numbers of Anglo-Indians had already entered various other British and imperial units um, through pretending to be British or European. So there's the Women's Auxiliary Corps India. My grandmother was an officer in the Wakai, uh, and she used to tell me stories about her time in Burma and a trip that she took to Afghanistan when she, she had the opportunity to go to Kabul, but she insisted that she wanted to go to Kandahar because she'd heard a poem about there being spices in Kandahar. Um, and then I, I mentioned last time, and it, it was brought up this morning as well, the, the uniforms that uh, the Wakai offices included um, Indian women of other, of other communities, particularly Indian Christians as well, and so choosing a sari would be likely to be a choice or to signify that you were from an Indian Christian background, for example, wearing a, a skirt, a more British style, um, made you, you seem like part of the, the British imperial forces during the war. Um, this is the Anglo-Indian Association in London in 1935. Uh, so they... The association in London was trying to shape um, the community's demands to the, the British government in Britain, and they had arguments with Gidney, who said that the London association is, is comprised of 
Anglo-Indians in London, so it shouldn't purport to represent the community in India, and it doesn't have a mandate to represent the community in India. So there were some power struggles there, and equally there were power struggles over representation with the Southern Anglo-Indian Association, which, which refused to amalgamate with the All India and Burma Anglo-Indian and Domiciled European Association. So here, here's a, a map showing the branches of the All India and Burma Anglo-Indian and Domiciled European Association. So it's very widespread coverage. We should remember that like some of the branches of the early Indian National Congress Party were simply a plaque on, on, a, on a local lawyer's door. You know, they weren't, not all branches of, of the Congress were, were necessarily really active branches, but when I look at the, um, the various positions of the office, office holders of these provincial branches, most of these seem to have been actually real, um, real offices representing a very large number of Anglo-Indian communities spread across India and Burma. You can note that there's three or four branches in, in what, is, uh, what became a separate territory from British India. Burma separated in 1935 and up to that point was treated as, as a, a province of British India. I, I particularly like this cartoon and I, I think I'm likely to use it in almost every publication that I ever do, like wherever possible. Um, it, it really shows how Anglo-Indians like to perceive themselves. It, it, it's a it's an, uh, cartoon that's making a, um, an argument about constitutional safeguards, that, that what the Anglo-Indians are asking for is less than what the other minorities, the, the Dalits and the Muslims, are asking for. They're asking only for temporary safeguards. And usually... If you're a small group, it's hard to argue for, for, for political rights, for special political measures. Whereas if you're a larger group, it's easier to say, well, we, we're such a large group, we deserve some kind of representation, some kind of special protection. And this quite skillfully, cleverly tries to invert this by suggesting that because the Anglo-Indian community is so small, therefore, it's like a, a young boy, even smaller than, than these other two children, and therefore it's, the small size of the group is more deserving of special protection. So it, it's a very clever, well-thought-out political cartoon to make the case that it, it wants to make. And also note the, the European boy is wearing shoes, and the, the sort of ethnic caricatures of the other communities are not wearing shoes, and the British are in the position of umpires, which is the, the role that the British themselves like to present themselves as playing. Like we are the sort of impartial arbiters amongst the communal arguments that take place between different interest groups. Um, so, so this will have been published sometime around, around the 1935 Act, probably around 1933 from the Anglo-Indian Review. Um, and then this is a very schematic um, diagram of a, a model Anglo-Indian colony uh, in, in Whitefield. There were multiple plans for different sub suburbs, different kind of sections of what would be Whitefield. And this, this is the most um, geometrically neat design, perhaps, perhaps too artificial, too planned and unrealistic. But it, uh, it includes a village green, a, a church on the top of a hill, a sort of town center meeting place. I mean, it's very neatly thought out. Uh, so it, it points towards a, a great deal of planning and a kind of utopianism that characterized a lot of the agricultural schemes. The other thing I should say is that um, these agricultural schemes colonies, whether they would be within mainland India or in the Indian Ocean, such as the Andaman Islands, or whether they would even be further abroad, such as in former Dutch, New, uh, German New Guinea. Um, they, these kind of ideas spanned a, a much longer period of time than I imagined when I began my research, because back in the, th that earlier period of the Ricketts petition around 1830 and 1829, there were 
there were suggestions in, um, in one of the three presidencies that, the, that the, the group would be given a special site, which would be a palace at pool share or full share, in which they would develop some kind of agricultural training center for um, agricultural and horticultural skills to be taught to Anglo-Indian youth. So I think that, all the way back in the, around 1830, um, Sir John Malcolm, the governor of Bombay, was proposing to, to the Anglo-Indians, to the then Eurasians, that some kind of agricultural training scheme could be the solution to their economic problems. So we, we begin with these kind of ideas all the way back at the early part of the 19th century. And th these kind of ideas and projects, whether they're acted upon or not, persist all the way till about the 1960s, when the Anglo-Burman community is suggesting some kind of joint colonization scheme with Anglo-Indians uh, in the Andaman Islands. And also, there is a, an organization in Bangalore, which may not be a, a very real organization. It may be more of an organization on paper, but it calls itself the Eurasian Collectivist um, Society of, of some kind. And it proposes that there should be a pan-Eurasian colony of mixed-race peoples, not only from India, but from the rest of the European empires in Asia, and that they should together collectively create an agricultural colony. And what is the, what is the potential model for these, these colony projects? In that case, a, a state, you know, some, somewhere outside of India, would be conceived of as something like Israel, or you, know, you could, of course, compare it with Pakistan that you're going to create a new country, essentially. Um, and uh, explicitly, they do look to examples like, like Israel, where there are these uh, kibbutz and large-scale uh, Jewish settlement in, in Mandate Palestine uh, before the creation of the State of Israel. So um, I, I like this quote because it, it sort of shows that there was this broader space where Anglo-Indians, ethnic Anglo-Indians and ethnic Anglo-Burmans living in, in Burma as well as in India felt part of a sort of collective space. And these are five young unmarried men who are in Burma, a little jungle station where Anglo-Indians were few and far between. This is in 1934. And uh, they, they saw one of the magazines promoting the McCluskey Gunj colony and they, they're basically saying that it's, it's a great inspiration to them. And I, I like the language here because they say this could be our Mecca, you know, which is an interesting uh, image. One of the Anglo-Indian, um, one of the McCluskey Gunge promotional magazines describes McCluskey Gunge as our Muluk. So you have a wide range of interesting terms as well as comparisons with a Jewish settlement in Mandate Palestine that somehow the, that we're looking for a Zion in that case, and in this case, we're looking for a Mecca. So yes, um, here we have the, the advert which has uh, McCluskey Gunge as our Muluk. So we're essentially looking for a home. And I do describe some of these projects as being somewhat escapist in, in their inspiration, in their conceptualization. Um, so, this is Sir Henry Gidney meeting Sir Stafford Cripps. He was deeply disappointed when, when Cripps, um, who, was, who was a socialist and had very little knowledge or understanding of the Anglo-Indian community or its past, unlike some of the, li the liberals and conservatives that, that Gidney had been used to dealing with. Gidney had been to Britain. He'd lobbied the British Parliament during the 1935 Government of India Act. He'd been successful in getting an amendment in the House of Lords to the 1935 Government of India Act to give Anglo-Indians additional protections and reserved jobs. And when the Secretary of State for India said that this was just a declaration of intention, Gidney then launched an additional campaign to, uh, to continue to argue um, for the justiciability 
of those protections, uh, which means that the, the, the protections written into the, the 1935 Government of India Act in this amendment should not only be a statement of intention by the, the British or the British colonial government, but they should be a legal duty upon the, the government and the provincial governors to secure the implementation of that intention. So justiciability is, is an important uh, measure. And uh, those safeguards, of course, were presented as that earlier cartoon uh, showed as being only, always only a temporary thing. Yeah. Um, and yet, Frank Antony managed to turn them into, again, arguing that they would be temporary, managed to turn them into something which, at least in the case of the nominated seats to the, uh, the Lok Sabha and the provincial legislatures for the MLAs, has turned into a very um, long-lived set of provisions and protections for uh, the Anglo-Indian community and tied to its definition in the Indian constitution. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.